Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, good evening. Thank you for so much for joining us for this conversation. Uh, with one of my favorite CEOs in any industry, uh, outspoken, smart, gets things done, Patrick Pouyanné, Chairman and uh, CEO of Total. Uh, as you know, I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. We're also uh, streaming. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be with you this evening. <coughs> We've got a good a uh, group of experts, a uh, good number of board members. It's just wonderful to have you all here. Um, this marks uh, Mr. Pouyanné's uh, first visit to the Atlantic Council headquarters in D.C. Though not your first time with the Atlantic Council, we were lucky enough to host you at our inaugural Atlantic Council Global Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi in 2017. And, and we see this as a warm-up act for your next appearance in Abu Dhabi as well, so we hope to have you there again. Uh, Mr. Pune brings a wealth of experience in the en energy industry and the policy space uh, to his job as chairman and CEO. Uh, prior to joining Total, he held various positions in the French industry ministry and ministerial offices. He joined Total in 1997 and held several positions within the company before becoming CEO in 2014 and chairman of the board in 2015. Tonight, he will discuss Total's views on the challenge and opportunity of climate change as a responsible energy major. Uh, we are witnessing a shift in the global energy system. Uh, global energy demand is rising, and new sources of energy from renewables to unconventional hydrocarbons are transforming the energy mix in profound ways. Meanwhile, how we consume energy as the world considers the challenge of climate change is also reshaping what it means to be an energy uh, producer. Uh, we've, been, we've done a lot of work in the Global Energy Center on climate-related issues. Uh, we also uh, just got a major grant from the Rockefeller Foundation relaunching our Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation uh, Resilience Center where we'll, we're going to be focusing, above all, on climate-related work, also migration and security. Amidst all of these changes, the continued demand for oil and natural gas to meet our fuel and power generation needs poses a critical question. How do you meet these demands while still decarbonizing the energy system? Navigating the changes ahead uh, in global energy markets will be difficult. Uh, companies like Total will play a critical role in this transition and the decisions they will make will impact all of our lives. So with that, sir, I'd like to thank you again for choosing the Atlantic Council as a platform to offer your perspective. Uh, I'll do a Q&A uh, with uh, Mr. Pouyanné afterward, uh, try to open up uh, if we have sufficient time to the audience as well, and then we'll get into other questions uh, that you may not touch in your, um, in, in your opening remarks. Uh, oh, I don't know, geopolitics and DARCO, LNG, uh, but there's, plen there's plenty to talk about. Uh, sir, the platform is yours. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, in 2017, I was spending a lot of time in Abu Dhabi because the actions were taking place in Abu Dhabi. You know, Abu Dhabi was uh, putting into auction the large concession for 40 years. We were winners, so it's why you met me there. Today I'm spending more time with U.S. companies. I don't know why, but uh, there is activity here. And so I'm in Washington and I'm happy and honored to, to participate to this uh, session with you. I will be brief. I would just like to make some introduction and then we'll enter into this Q&A and answering questions. I think it's better. Just to explain what is all, I would say, uh, how do we uh, face and what do uh, face this climate challenge. In fact, before to speak about climate change, I will speak about evolution of the energy markets because for an oil and gas companies, when we think to our future, in fact, it's a matter of like all companies, when you establish a strategy for a company uh, about trying to anticipate what could be the market trends. And, uh, and the, in fact, my speech is only in this table. So it's, it's, it's a long speech, but I will not read it. Which, uh, the speech is enough. The speech, this table are just the three scenarios of the International Energy Agency about what could become the energy mix in 2040. And you have different scenarios. You have one which will lead, lead to a, a world of a business as usual, which is a world of four to five degrees. Uh, 
a more, uh, I would say, proactive world, which is, by the way, the one which has been described by the states uh, in the Paris Agreement, because the Paris Agreement set an objective which is under two degrees, but the reality of the con voluntary contributions by the states were not at all under two degrees. They were making more around three degrees. And then you have a scenario coping with, uh, with this Paris Agreement objective, which is under two. And it's interesting to look to the one we don't like for oil and gas company, which is the one of under two, because this describes a future. Uh, and uh, by the way, if we want to be on this scenario, uh, the first remark uh, is that, um, and this is a big challenge, the largest challenge for all of us, by the way, in the energy field, uh, is that today we are 7 billion people in the, this planet, or 7.5, we will be 9, 9.5 billion. Today we have one billion people who do not have access to electricity, to energy. Uh, if we want the three billion people additional to have access to energy, that's the main challenge. Because we should do that without uh, consuming more energy than today, with, which is an incredible challenge. That means that we first objective for all the energy uh, industries, all the societies, should be to have a huge energy efficiency uh, gain in order to be able to give access to energy to 9 billion people instead of 7 or 6 billion today with the same amount of energy. Having said that, the mix should evolve uh, quite dramatically, even if, and it's good for oil and gas companies, the hydrocarbons in a two-degree scenario will still represent around 50%, a little more than that, 55% by 2040. So we'll still need oil and more gas. The difficulty for me as chairman and CEO of an oil company is that we will need more, less oil in 2040 in such a scenario than today. It's difficult to say. So that, that means that I don't know what will be the trends, and the business as usual trend is, is different from that. Uh, but there is for oil demand some possibility, so uh, I would say a, a moderate growth, 1%, to a decrease of demand, uh, which of course is a challenge. And the first consequence for us is that, yes, we will continue to, to need oil and we need to continue to produce oil. But if these scenarios happen, obviously, it would have an impact on the price of oil. And so we must concentrate our, our efforts on what we call low-cost oil. And this is the first part of the strategy of Total. It makes little sense to go and uh, explore in Arctic for oil because I can find on this earth low-cost oil, for example, in the Middle East, and it's why you met me in Abu Dhabi. You know, if, uh, if Total was the most successful company in the Abu Dhabi concessions renewals, it's because there we can produce oil for less than $5 per barrel. So this, and clearly uh, we come back on it, but uh, as I said to my colleague of Saudi Aramco, don't be afraid, the last drop of oil will come from your country because it's the cheapest one. So that's the first part. The second part is the natural gas, because in these scenarios, we see that natural gas is growing. It's growing at 1.5 to 2%, but there is a growth for natural gas. Uh, but uh, in, if natural gas growth, it will be at the expense of coal, because in fact, the real competition is again be coal between natural gas. It's not a, an easy competition, let's be clear, because uh, uh, coal is... Uh, much cheaper to produce than natural gas. Uh, and it's why, by the way, uh, even if some people consider that coal is uh, an old energy, today it still represents something like tw almost 27% of the energy mix. And it, to produce electricity, the first source of feedstock for electricity is still coal on this planet. So we have to, so natural gas will have uh, a bright future, potentially, if we are able to make it competitive against coal, which means, uh, and in particular, we'll come back on it, all the LNG that you produce here and everywhere in the, in the world, we have to be uh, more efficient in order to lower the cost of the customers. Because, of course, uh, there are two key countries in this climate challenge, which are China and India, and both of them have natural resource, which is a lot of coal. And so, like all countries, because of security of supply, they prefer to develop their own resource rather than importing energy sources. So, natural gas is a natural axis, uh, after just I said, and so Total has taken two decisions on this path to become responsible. First, to leave, and we give up all our coal business. Uh, it seems to be obvious. It's not so obvious when you have to decide in 2015 when 
price of oil is going down to, to get rid of $100 million of results, but we've done it. So we are no more in the coal business. And on the contrary, we are accelerating on the natural gas, uh, on the LNG business, clearly, where after some acquisition, we are today the number two, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, international player in this field after Shell. And, uh, and in natural gas, with a strategy which is to integrate the full value chain, not only to be a producer, but also to be a, uh, to become a portfolio manager, I would say. And today, uh, Total, with 20 million tons of LNG, is able to provide to its customers uh, uh, LNG could, which could come from many places. And I don't sell to my Chinese customer US LNG to China. By the way, it would be, it's a little difficult today. I don't know why. But I say LNG from Total, to China, and then Total will maybe take his, his LNG to US, but maybe to Papua New Guinea or to Qatar or to Russia. You know, we like nice places in Total, and so uh, so that's uh, natural gas, and natural gas led us to when we look to value chain to electricity because natural gas country do not want to uh, just to buy natural gas at the end. Consumers are. Are, are using electricity. So there is a, a, a natural trend to go to electricity sometimes in some countries uh, uh, when we want to promote uh, natural gas to Myanmar or to Vietnam, but these customers, they don't want natural gas, they want electricity, in fact. So we have uh, there, and electricity is, uh, is uh, when we look to the trends of the energy mix in 2040, we can see that 30% in some scenarios, 20-30%, of the mix could, should come from renewables, essentially to produce electricity, because one of the key trends of all the emerging markets is that the electricity demand should grow almost double in 20 years, in fact, let's say. And our economy is more and more electrified for various, uh, for various reasons, and so we use more and more electricity. And so we decided in our strategy uh, even if today everybody considers Total as an oil company, in fact today we are more an oil and gas company, uh, we will become an oil and gas and low carbon electricity company. And what does that mean? That means that we want to, to produce electricity either from natural gas or from uh, renewables, but also to market it in an integrated way. So we have today, uh, since last year, six million customers in Europe to which we sell electricity every day, B2C customers. We have also some B2B customers, obviously. And so, so in fact, what I just described is to try to adapt the strategy of the company and in, uh, uh, in the next 20 years to the evolution of the market trends. And all that is leading in terms of, uh, in terms of climate change contribution uh, to, I would say, if we, uh, to one objective or to one ambition, which is in fact to uh, gradually decrease the average CO2 content of all the energy products we sell. And with this strategy, we will be able to decrease it between 2015 and 2013, 2030 by 15%. So the energy products we will sell to our customers, which will be a mix of oil, of gas, of uh, low carbon electricity, the average CO2 content will decrease by 15%. Achieving that, we are more or less on the road to go to the, to, to the goal of two degrees. We, can, we, will do, we will continue this strategy, and by 2040, it's at least 25%. So that's, uh, that's pragmatically what we will do, in fact. We'll also, of course, take care of our own emissions on our own operations, which, of course, is uh, the first duty that we have. But I would say what I just described is what we call Total wants to become a responsible energy major. Become because this is a journey, it's a strategic journey, which implies for us not only to continue to be a, an excellent oil and gas company, but also to part is, uh, of the strategy is diversification to this uh, uh, low carbon electricity. Uh, energy, because the world energy is not only oil and gas, it's also, again, uh, other sources of energy and major because we want to remain one of the major company in this field. So having said that, I just describe what is your ambition and I think the best is to answer to your question to clarify it. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, <coughs> Uh, terrific opening remarks, and, 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 and you answered uh, in your opening comments a lot of what was my first question, which was um, what are the steps uh, to live up to your motto of responsible energy major. But if we were to visit Total five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, was it, how does the company look different at each of those stages in your view? Some of it, I, obviously, you can't foresee, but uh, a lot of it is, in a company like yours, is going to be based on the uh, investments you've said na making now. So you've said oil, you've said natural gas, you've said low carbon electricity. But how, how do you think this energy major to the outside world looks different uh, in, uh, in stages over the next 20 years? Well, the first of your stage, <coughs> obviously, is that uh, today we are producing, even if everybody considers it as an oil company, we, should, we are oil and gas because it's a production which is 50-50. Of course, the revenues are coming more from oil than from natural gas because uh, the margin per barrel of oil is better than the margin per barrel of natural gas, to be honest. Uh, but it's obvious that in five years of production, or because most of our strategy is linked, uh, a large part of the strategy is linked to, to LNG, and I will come back on it, uh, but we will be more gassy than oil. So in five years, I think we'll become a gas and oil company and not an oil and gas company. Uh, and, uh, and that we say why LNG is interesting, because it's a, very, it's a market which evolved very quickly. Uh, you have many points of production around the world, including here in the US, which was not anticipated some years ago. And you have many customers around the world because there was some technology evolutions which makes more easy to regasify natural gas uh, in many countries. And so you see a sort of uh, fluidity in that liquidity in that market, which opens a lot of opportunities. And for major companies like us, as there is a, uh, I would say, a capital intensity hurdle, barrier, it's very good to enter into this business and to grow. So I would say it's, uh, it's clearly the first step of the evolution, which would be to invest more and more to be a major player in natural gas. On the longer term, I would say if I want to be consistent, we describe the scenario. Uh, as I said, to be able to meet this ambition to reduce the average CO2 content of our products by 25% in 2040, the company should be around, I would say, uh, just rough figures around 50% natural gas, 35% oil, and 15, 20% low carbon electricity. Mm -hmm. Which means uh, we will remain an oil company, we continue to produce oil, but we'll produce much more gas, and we'll have a real uh, business in this low carbon electricity. And this is, of course, the main challenge because of diversification for us uh, in uh, some energies where the business model are not fully established, but we are investing uh, every year in order to fit with that objective. Uh, uh, th thank you for that. Uh, I'd also be remiss of the uh, people I want to salute here before we get going any further. Uh, Dick Morningstar and Randy Bell, um, uh, founding director of our Global Energy Center and the director of Global Energy Center. Uh, we've, been, we've, we've been talking and, and pushing LNG and what was happening in natural gas even before it, it, uh, it became the buzzword for everybody. I think Dustin Hoffman, it was plastics, and uh, now everybody's talking about natural gas. Um, if you're looking at your climate commitments, um, clearly there are things from a CEO's position are really difficult, but you've got to do them. And then there are other things that are really easy wins. What do you see as easy wins in what you're trying to get done, and what are the, what, what are the things that are just harder? Is you think, you know, uh, uh, engaging the company on energy efficiency, uh, it's a matter of motivation of the people. You get them some objectives and uh, there is many things to be done. Uh, we set an objective, which is to reduce an absolute target of greenhouse gas from 46 million tons to less than 40 million tons by 2025. I'm convinced we will do it. It's, uh, and, uh, and by the way, it's fitting well in our downstream business with the necessity for refiners to e every year to continue to, to enhance their energy efficiency. You stop flaring, for example, is the other easy win. You know, stop flaring. Uh, we have managed to, since we decided that by 2010, we have reduced our flaring by 80%, uh, which is quite easy to do. And 
Last 20% maybe will be a little, little more difficult, but we will manage that. So stop mm -hmm. running and monetizing the gas. That's easy wins. It's a matter more of just uh, thinking to that. Uh, what I said about uh, uh, natural gas is, uh, I would say, developing of natural gas is part of our DNA, so we should manage to, to get this project. One thing which we need to tackle is all the methane emissions. We need to really, because there is this debate about natural gas, is it really a contributor? So we need to take seriously the methane emissions. We have a very low level of uh, upstream. Uh, upstream, it's easy. You know, we have, I think we are not far from less than 0.2%. So it's minimum. The problem of natural gas and methane emissions, which is more complex, is a, is a whole chain, you know. Because uh, we are not, uh, of can be we steward about our products, natural gas. Generally, the people complain about emissions, but it's generally in the city gas uh, networks, you know, and uh, it's difficult for us to control that. But we have to find ways uh, to be responsible ourselves about that, or also about that. What is more complex than in this journey, if we want to think to the future, is all what is around, uh, I would say, uh, natural uh, uh, CO2 sinks. Uh, CCUS technologies. We will need CCUS because when I describe my, in, you know, people begin to speak about, uh, by the way, it's in the Paris Agreement about uh, neutrality. Uh, it's obvious that even in 2050 or 2070, we will continue to use hydrocarbon. But if we want to get the neutrality, we'll be need to compensate it. So uh, it's the sinks can be either CCUS or natural sinks, you know, forests and all that, which are difficult topics for different reasons. There is no clear public policy today favoring the CCUS, except, by the way, this US administration, which is doing good innovation, which is, a, and we try to contribute to mm -hmm. that. It's interesting to see that uh, this administration, which declares that we are not in favor of climate change, is working well on this topic, which mm -hmm. is good. Uh, natural things and forests as well. We have decided to invest $100 million per year to try to, to engage in some program. It's difficult for us because we are not experts at all, so we need to find the right topics. Uh, and then, uh, I think there is another challenge for everybody, which is uh, uh, if we uh, think to a world and people, I was reading papers that people think you can be 100% uh, renewable uh, electricity in the US. I don't know, 2030, I have some doubts, but uh, we'll see. Uh, there is one main challenge, which is electricity storage, you know. Electricity storage and battery business is something which is not yet fully mature, contra contra to contrary to what people think. So these are more difficult technologies and challenges for us. Um, what, since you're on technology, let's stick with that with a, uh, for a moment. So uh, we've seen uh, s some of the oil majors in Total as well, as you said, making interesting investments in non-hydrocarbon technologies, solar, some even talking about fusion. You just mentioned the batteries. Um, <coughs> uh, what's the what's the game changer? The biggest game changer from your standpoint in terms of technologies? What excites you the most that you're looking at? Uh, again, electricity storage yeah, is really yeah. a, a huge step. If you want to to make renewables really profitable, uh, because you know when you invest in a solar farm today. With 100 megawatt, you are using 15% uh, of it. You are, and most of the energy, you lose it because you are not able to store it. And so there is really, a, by, by the way, we bought uh, in 2016, we bought a battery company, Saft, with the objective to be able to go quicker in this technology of energy storage, I would say. And, uh, uh, and I think it's uh, something on which we need to work hard, and it will be the right combination. Uh, for me, the ideal world in 2040, 50, uh, would be a, a world of natural gas, renewables, and electricity storage. These are the three mm -hmm. key components uh, that we need. And as we will need to neutralize the natural gas, that means that we are able to, to manage all the CCUS technologies. These are the four key technologies we need to, to tackle. Then, in terms of renewables, uh, we have been impressed recently by the huge progress made in offshore wind, which uh, was a surprise to us. Mm. Uh, and I think in solar, we, are, we have been, uh, there is not much to win in solar efficiency cells. I think we are not far from having the right products. And even if we continue to, to lower the cost, uh, but it's more the mass markets which is able, which is allow us to, to lower the cost. Uh, so that's the main point. We don't look at all to fusion. I mean, we spend a lot of money to, to monitor, to look in many yeah. technologies. 
but not nuclear, not fusions. You yeah. know, we, yeah. I don't like that. Uh, no, it's not I don't like. We cannot do everything. Yeah. We know yeah. nothing about it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we look at hydrogen. We look at uh, <coughs> things like that or second generation <coughs> biomass, but uh, biotech. But all that is a little immature to go to the, in, to the scalability of it. We are a little far from that. Um, so l let me ask you to put on your geopolitical hat for a moment. You, you mentioned in your opening comments that you operate in nice places, uh, which I we think operate where we find oil and gas. Right, right, and 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 some of them are <laughs> tricky, tricky locations. Um, so uh, you, you're obviously uh, investing more in U.S. LNG. Second round of investment. I see Amos here and Tellurian's Driftwood LNG terminal. Uh, as you look at the world, where we have an, um, the major power competition is heating up. Uh, you're seeing it in the tariffs in China. Uh, obviously, this could influence uh, you know, Chinese tariffs on U.S. LNG exports over the long term, so that could influence that market. You're investing more in, in the U.S. You're also investing more, if I'm not mistaken, also in Russia. As you're looking at the world uh, uh, and you're looking at geopolitical risks, which plays a larger role in your industry than many others, how are you, how, how, how are you um, baking that into your decisions? And how do you balance you know, how much you're going to put into the U.S. versus how much you're going to put into China, how you're going to put into Russia? And then what happens if suddenly uh, the U.S. and China are starting to break up the world into economic and technological spheres? That's, uh, you know, we have Total is the, uh, is the only major company with no hydrocarbons, no natural resources in, this in our country. We managed to build that company, and by, by company, and even if there is, we cannot explore it. So, mm -hmm. so, so we are. So we have been. So, question for me is uh, from uh, I would say the top of the company is. In fact, the, the answer is always the same. You have to spread your geopolitical risk about many countries. And uh, because even, you know, uh, the U.S. seems to be nice, and, uh, except if they begin to, make, to, to have some trade wars with some customers, you know, and then <laughs> it's, le it's less nice. And so, yeah. you know, so I think the real answer to that. So at the end, of course, for us, uh, US, uh, the U.S. are obviously an obvious land for us to invest in LNG. You have huge gas resource uh, for years, for decades, low cost, uh, low price probably. Uh, you know, we took about, you were thinking about driftwood and almost is there. Uh, why did you want to invest in driftwood? Uh, just because, you know, uh, the only request I had for, to, to them is uh, we want to have a pipeline between driftwood and the Permian, you know, because we, these guys are producing oil and oil. They flare and flare and flare and flare more and more. There will be a limit. So we will have natural gas for a low, very low price, there, which is quite clear. So then, and it could be long that. So that that means, and then, uh, so you have a good position to be able then to export either to, to China because the main markets in LNG is more Asia than Europe. Yeah. Uh, let me be clear. Uh, and so we can export. So it's a good place. Having said that, uh, we have we have various natural resources, which makes. Uh, other places very competitive, you know, uh, Qatar has been an historic place to produce uh, uh, LNG and we are one of the main players. Russia, we opened a new frontier with Novatec and Yamal. Everybody was thinking that we are just crazy to try to produce LNG uh, 600 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in the middle of nowhere. That's, that's clear, it was a little crazy to be honest. <laughs> but we, we've done it and it's the only project which has been performed, we, we managed to launch all the trains before schedule and, and the budget, so it's fine. Uh, and we'll do it in there, there is huge amount of gas resource, which makes that we can produce the natural gas for, gas for less than one dollar per million BTU. And, and so it can be, even this location can make sense. Of course, there is a risk, I understand. Uh, we are, and then we are, we love risk, so we have decided to embark in the Mozambique story, you know, you know, so it's another nice place, or in Papua New Guinea, but, you know, I don't decide where we find a large resource of gas, then it's, mm. a, so the answer to your question is a combination, I mean, we, we, we combination of countries, and we have, in a company, in order to manage, some, we have some rules, which is a certain limit of capital employed by country that we don't want to, to, um, to go beyond, but the advantage to be a major company with a very large balance sheet is that we can absorb this type of risk, you know, and so 
uh, none of them, even if there is a collapse, will, uh, will, be, uh, will put Total into danger. And, and on the trajectory of geopolitical risk, do you see uh, the line going up, or is it pretty steady state from what you experience in your life? No, no. Today, as uh, the, the world, uh, clearly you see some trends around the world of, uh, of fracturation. I mean, uh, you see uh, there, is, uh, there are clear trends of uh, everywhere in, in, in many countries. It's true in many continents, by the way, even in Europe, you know, Brexit, uh, populism in Italy, France, all that. And clearly you have trends of isolationism by countries, and the U.S. are. It's not clear, by the way, yeah. it began not with President Trump, it began before, you know. So you see some isolationist trend, but some c big countries think they can stay alone and not to take care of the rest of the world. So we see some fracturations, clearly. And, uh, and I think, yes, we are, we are in a more dangerous world. Mm. That's clear. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to turn to questions from the audience. Let me ask one more that mm. is uh, 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 also a little bit on the news. Uh, which is uh, Total's role in Oxy's acquisition of Andarco. Um, now that the deal's complete, uh, it, what's interesting to me from your role is uh, your interest in Andarco's assets in Africa, which I think is what encouraged you to participate in the deal, if I'm not mistaken. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and what, what was it that interested you? Well, it's, it's clear. I mean, uh, you know, our strategy uh, has been, we said to our investors, uh, we play to our strengths. And what are the strengths of Total? It's uh, uh, Middle East, Africa, uh, North Sea, uh, deep water, LNG. And what are the assets of Anadarko in Africa? It's the LNG, it's Africa first and North Africa. It's uh, Algeria, LNG in Mozambique, and deep water in Ghana. So it's just fitting exactly and perfectly with what we announce. And in fact, I can reveal it. We were looking to these assets for more than one year. We have given some discussions before uh, with Anadarko, and then we, when we discovered that uh, morning that Chevron would take everything, uh, okay, we have been agile, but it was not uh, uh, a lot of creativity to think that uh, these assets were not really fitting well for Oxy, and that there was a p potential match between Oxy and Total. So it's just. Uh, a matter of sending an email to my colleague, and uh, and then I was bringing her, I think, one part of the solution for her to win. Mm -hmm. But it's Oxy who has done the deal, it's not Total. You know, I was just buying an option and supporting that. It was Oxy decision to put $76 per share for Anadarko, which was not Total. You know, Total <laughs> is just uh, uh, benefiting from the determination of Oxy, and I thank Vicky to have done it. Mm -hmm. But I think then, uh, it's important because it's a proof that uh, we are very consistent with our strategy and, uh, and uh, we have demonstrated that even large corporations can be very agile, which is a good part of the, the way to make good deals. Thank, thank you for that. Let me turn to questions. I'll start here. And I know you well, but why don't you identify yourself with the audience? Thank you. David Goldwyn with the Atlantic Council. Um, uh, congratulations on your, on your vision. Uh, underneath that vision is a great optimism about demand for natural gas. And while the projections are big today, gas penetration in India, in Southeast Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa is not great. So I wonder, what is your vision of how that will change? Where will gas, where will gas be sold? Will it be for electricity or other sectors? And is climate policy an indispensable part of the driver for gas demand? I mean, today when we observe uh, the dynamic of natural gas in, in China, for example, which is today one of the main markets, before climate policy, it's, I would say, air quality policy. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge for China, and it will be the same for India in these very populated countries and cities, is that uh, if, they can't, if they have a problem, health issue for people, you know, and. Uh, the level of pollution in the cities uh, is reaching levels which are incredibly high. Uh, in Europe, we complain at a level of 100, and in Beijing, they are, live, they are living every day in 300, so the equivalent of 300, you know. So I think we have a very fair, clear dynamic, which is more the local environmental matters. And, but the answer by natural gas trying to replace uh, coal is also the good answer for the global problem, which is climate change. But don't make a mistake, the Chinese are more driven by local pollution 
fight against local pollution rather than just the climate change, but the solution fits well. By the way, in the US as well. I'm convinced that if Obama to suddenly, if the Obama administration decided to support the Paris Agreement, it's just because with all the natural gas you had here, at very low price, you were able to shift from coal to gas. So the math were in the favor of, of the United States. So you signed, and the Chinese are. So in China, there is a clear dis decision that uh, it's all, the natural gas is only, was only 6% of the mix. Today it's 8%, 8-9%. They want to reach 10 15%. The only difficulty for China, it's very interesting, is the price of natural gas, because they need to import it compared to a natural, a natural resource with coal, and it's less expensive. So for them, it's an arbitration because affordability of the energy for their development against uh, environmental matters. But they are making a clear choice uh, in favor of natural gas. I think India is less obvious uh, because the economics uh, and the way that uh, the economic fundamentals are not the same. Uh, but we've seen in the last years also quite a clear development of natural gas in India. So, but clear again, I, I, I'm optimistic, that's clear. Uh, but, um, and then it's why also we advocate to see some carbon pricing. Uh, carbon pricing is the obvious tool. And uh, the UK have just demonstrated that to the world, you know. The UK have decided to put a carbon pricing mechanism around, uh, let's say, $20 per ton, a uh, little more, $25 per ton. And last week, for the first time since uh, 1892, they managed to produce electricity without a single, without any coal. And with $25 per ton, so it's a signal, a, an economic signal which is sent, <coughs> uh, and which is enough. So it will help, obviously, natural gas. And if total, let be clear, if I'm advocating for carbon pricing, it's because it's, the, it's one of the tools to favor natural gas against coal mm. and to compensate this cost deficit. The other things that we have to do <coughs> on all sides with the industry is to continue to diminish the cost of producing LNG and transporting LNG and logistics, and that's our duty. And I think I'm convinced that we can do big, be much better. You know, uh, today in the cost of LNG <coughs> that we ship from, for example, US to China, the logistics represent $1.5 per million BTU. It's huge compared when you sell that five or six dollars or seven dollars, you know. So if we can be smarter and stop sending uh, gas, you know, today I'm sending gas from Russia to, to China and Qatar is sending his, his LNG from Qatar to Poland. Maybe I could go from Russia to Poland. It's a little complex geopolitically. <laughs> and it's not the best example. I should I find another one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and Qatar could go to China. So all that needs to be organized. And I'm convinced because you have mean large players with portfolio management, we have to organize it and to be more efficient for our customers. So there is room to, be, to, to, to offer our, our product, our gas product, at a lower cost. You satisfied with that, David? OK, thank you. Please. We've got a question here, and then Robin, please, first here, and then, then the back. Well, I'm Bronco Terzic with the Atlantic Council. Uh, curiously, last year, the OPEC's uh, projections showed greater electric vehicle penetration than even promoters of electric vehicles. And since transportation is predominantly on oil, what do you see moving ahead with respect to electricity, electrification of our transportation, uh, automobiles, shipping trains? Do you see that as a big market? You, uh, yes, you have some trends, a question in particular, again, China is leading the world once again. By the way, if you observe uh, clearly, and uh, uh, it, it, there are some trade disputes, but more fundamentally, what the policy of China should ask a lot of questions to all our, our world, because uh, in all these new energies, uh, solar cells, batteries, electric vehicles, they are at the front of all of them. A deliberate policy, a huge state support, and uh, I think it's something which uh, I would not be surprised to see in 20 years most of these industries dominated by Chinese companies. And that's, I, mean, I think, a real concern, and we should accelerate on our world on these new uh, energies to, to get the jobs and to, to, to get the companies being ready. Yes, there are some trends, we see that clearly. It's difficult. The consumers will decide as well, you know, because there is a lot of hurdles in front of uh, developing uh, uh, electric vehicles, you know. And uh, but 
I'm convinced that in large cities, very quickly, uh, you will see in large cities, you will see uh, electric, electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles dominating uh, because of air quality again in these cities. Where it's less obvious to me is long distance transportation. Uh, because that we require a huge investment in some infrastructure. For the time being, nobody is ready to pay uh, all these charging stations on long distance storage, you know, and we are working on it and it's difficult business. Uh, but uh, having said that, um, we made a lot of scenarios and we published some in February. Uh, we made a very aggressive scenario where we said uh, by 2040, 50% of all the new cars, passenger cars, will be uh, electrified. Uh, that represents potentially a diminution of oil consumption of 10 million barrels of oil per day. 10, not 100. You know, uh, so uh, just to, sometimes we open the newspapers, electric cars means end of oil. No, it doesn't work like that, you know. Because part of the transportation, uh, because first, it's mainly urban vehicles, so they don't make drive a lot of kilometers or miles. And second, but ma main part of the consumption of oil for transportation is more for uh, trucks and uh, heavy duties, you know, and all this. And there, we don't see that moving to electrification very, very quickly. Thank you for that. So I'm going to go here, Robin, and then in back, and then I'll come back up here. Hi, I'm Robin West with the Atlantic Council. Um, you're talking about tough neighborhoods uh, for the oil and gas business around the world. One neighborhood you didn't mention is the Eastern Mediterranean, where huge discoveries have been made. And uh, you have uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Israel, uh, Egypt, uh, Cyprus. Uh, this, there are huge structures that have been discovered. What do you think is the potential? Are you likely to invest? Are you likely to be active there? Um, how do you see that? Yes, we are. We are active. I mean, uh, we, we are not very active in Egypt. We missed the Egypt story. Maybe uh, one day we'll make some M&A on Egypt. I don't know which one. Uh, no. Uh, we are active in Cyprus, uh, which is uh, at the middle. Uh, but Lebanon, Cyprus, Israel is a good triangle where you have a lot of geopolitics. You know, uh, Turkey is willing to, to put, uh, is threatening when we do it in its time. Uh, Exxon has done a discovery. We are working with VNI. We'll have a new we have, I think, uh, in three or four licenses, and we continue to do it. We make a discovery. We made a discovery last year. We need to appraise it. Lebanon is another part where we are looking. It's very unexplored. And by the way, uh, and uh, I know that you know you have disputed stories. I, Amos was an expert of it uh, with Israel and Lebanon. And by the way, uh, you gave me the opportunity to, to repeat, but uh, there was some. Uh, uh, Total is the only major company today who invests in Israel. I have some battery business in Israel. I like this country, let's be clear. Uh, there was some, uh, the FT make an end light with something. They asked me a question. What do you think about exploring Israel? I just said, it seems difficult from a geolo geological point of view, you know, but I have nothing again. I, I want to invest in Israel if I can do that. <laughs> and uh, maybe Total will be the, the company who will one day will drill on this triangle, you know, uh, between Israel and Lebanon because we have a debate maybe for nothing, you know, we are, by the way, our geologists are more interested in the block nine or the north than the south of the block nine. So, I mean, I'm, uh, uh, yes, there is a potential, it's next to Europe. Uh, so Europe is fundamentally a continent where the own domestic production is declining. So you have an obvious market for all these gas with the European markets. Uh, and so it's worth spending some time. Having said that, I hope that we'll, uh, We'll need the U.S. Navy plus the French Navy in order for us to protect us to continue to drill, you know. But, uh, uh, but it's part of the game sometimes. Uh, we like that. We, I told you, we like difficult stories. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so in the back, I saw a question. Is it still there? Thank you. Hi, Emily Meredith from Energy Intelligence. Um, I was wondering if you could be specific on geopolitical risk in the Middle East today. Um, with the issue, oh sorry, with um, the Strait of Hormuz and the Fujairah issues, both for oil markets and for your investments in the Gulf? You know, I mean, uh, we are, uh, there is, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not surprised by what is happening and the US policy towards Iran, you know. Uh, uh, we have been the first mover to Iran and we have been also the first to retreat because, uh, I mean, uh, 
There was a GCPOA was signed, we could do it. After that, I had the long discussions with the US administration. It was very clear to me that uh, what is good with your administration is that they do what they say, you know, which is good for planning uncertainty. So uh, they decided, so I'm, I was more surprised to see some quota being, ac being awarded in November than what is happening in May, to be honest. Uh, having said that, what would be the consequence is, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how, how far the pressure is. Of course, all that, by the way, uh, even if it, it could have some risk on some of our activity, at the same time, it pushes the price of all up. Huh? So I think, globally speaking, for Total, it's not so bad. <laughs> Maybe it's bad for some consumers, but uh, I suspect all these tensions are just pushing the price up and up and up. Mm -hmm. So we'll see up to which point the tension will be. Uh, and I'm not fully convinced that this policy will, will, will work, but it's not my, I'm not a diplomat, I'm not a, a government official, I'm just a CEO of an oil company. <laughs> Please. Hi, uh, Akshat Rari, I'm a journalist with Quartz and a fellow here at the council. Um, and my question is, you said that electricity storage is immature. Um, I wanted to understand what do you think needs to be done to make it mature, and how does SAFT fit into that strategy? No, what I, th what I was saying is that uh, today, uh, I mean, uh, if we want to make large-scale uh, energy storage at large scale, the lithium-ion technologies that we have today are not the most efficient. It's quite expensive. So we need to continue to work on it. Uh, there will be the lithium solid state, and there are other, uh, you know, e electricity, we learned that at school, but, uh, storing electrons, they don't like that, you know. And so we do it for chemistry, but these chemistry are quite complex to manage. So I think uh, a mistake would be to consider that this, with lithium ion technology, we have what we want. No, we don't have what we want. So SAFT is a company where we have many technologies and we continue to work on expanding that and developing new technologies. Thank you. We have a question here and then uh, from Nelson. Kind but of yeah, there are other ways, by the way, to store yes. electricity. Hydrogen could be one of them. Hydrogen, the main interest for me of hydrogen is not necessarily only a source of energy, but it's, it could be a storage. And so that's interesting to follow. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Bella Chen, a uh, visiting scholar at ISWES Center. And, um, you know, I see that, you know, in, uh, countries with uh, very cold winter, like Japan, for example, or European countries, they use a lot of natural gas for heating. But, you know, in Southeast Asia, like in Vietnam, you know, the weather is not so hot there, and we don't even have a like, system for heating at, at home. So uh, I wonder whether, uh, what is the demand now for natural because gas? Because you, you do the country. In your countries, you need climatization. Mm -hmm. And the huge market for electricity in uh, Southeast Asia is climatization. Um. So you don't eat, you, you want cold. But you know, at the end, you need, natural, you need natural gas in both cases. Mm. Mm, but we don't even have a system there. No, so no, I you, you will yeah. have them. You will see. The more you develop your level of life, the more you want climatization. Like here, it's too cold, by the way, you know, here yeah, today. <laughs> <laughs> I was frozen this afternoon in an hotel, and there again, you know, so <laughs> you will see. It's a natural trend. The consumers will require, will require that. Question of level of life. So do, uh, do your company, you know, does your company help with that, with to develop the infrastructure for the, the products the yeah. that you offer? But uh, the, uh, climate decision requires electricity fundamentally, yeah. you know, and then you have uh, products. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, I've, Nelson, let me, I think these will be the like maybe the last two questions. Uh, the, these oh ones well, let's take them now, let one or two. Yeah, let, let, let me pick it. I, I only see, I see three. Let's pick them up. One, two, three. Nelson first, and, then, and this will be the final round. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, and you actually, uh, Nelson Cunningham with McClarty Associates, you answered half my question earlier with your question about Iran policy today and how that's impacting the markets. But uh, since you were early, uh, early investors into Iran after the JCPOA, uh, let me ask you a longer term question. What do you think the longer term role of Iran is in serving the energy markets um, in, in Europe and the surrounding areas. Maybe you can touch on Iraq at the same time, <laughs> but, but, yeah. but please. Hi, Megan Gordon with S&P Global Platts. You've referred to the North Sea as Total's garden. Um, are you satisfied with the business climate right now in terms of Brexit? Um, and do you think the infrastructure there is sufficient in terms of pipelines? Great, and last question. 
I see right here. Hi, Daniel Mule with Oxfam, and it's uh, great to hear you reaffirm Total's desire to become a responsible energy major. Um, as Oxfam, we've also seen Total's movement uh, in that direction even beyond climate with its commitment to uh, contract disclosure, which we've applauded. Uh, Total also being on the board of EITI and reporting uh, annually on its payments to governments under EU transparency directives are also positive steps. Um, I'm wondering just to what extent um, uh, you see room to work with other peer companies to take those sort of actions as well. Um, is there an opportunity to advocate publicly for this, for instance, as soon as EITI's conference next month? And then secondly, um, another place related to that where we haven't yet seen um, uh, Total fully take movement is in endorsing a set of responsible tax practices and tax principles um, a la the B team, which some of your peer organizations have, peer uh, companies have, including Shell and Repsol. So is that also something that Total is uh, interested in considering? Okay. And, uh, and I think what lies behind that question is the, uh, the pressures probably aren't over on major energy yeah, yeah, companies. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, the word responsible is not only climate, it's yeah. also responsible vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the world society for me, because yeah. clearly the society is expecting from corporations like Total more than just you pay your tax and you are uh, just a producer of energy, they expect more from us. So I, I will answer the question. Yeah. Iran first, maybe. I mean, uh, Iran, to be clear, for the time being, it's not a matter of what they can contribute. Uh, there are other matters. And by the way, we can understand the position uh, which is taken today. You know, uh, there was a GCPA. There are other issues with Iran, including in the region, in terms of instability of the region. Uh, having said that, we all know that it's a country with huge resource of gas, of natural gas. Uh, it's also a, a huge domestic market, and we should not forget it. So for, by the way, the projects on which we were working were mainly for domestic use and not for export. And uh, I don't think Iran will never be a very large LNG producer because they need the gas fundamentally for them or for their neighborhood country. To connect Iran to Europe, uh, you know, you have to cross few countries which are a little shaky. So this type of projects I'm not sure I want to participate to this type of pipeline investments. I will let them do by others. F European states have some money, sometimes strange ideas. Uh, no, I think uh, it's complex that. Uh, but for the time being, it's not the matter, you know. Um, uh, then the second, North Sea, I think. Oh, on, uh, honestly, North Sea, we have no, well, it's no difficulty. Brexit does not, we are working in, uh, in markets which are world markets, and I would say there is no impact of Brexit on our activity in the North Sea. I mean, I don't see that at all. Uh, you, you know, Brexit is mainly an issue uh, when you have uh, uh, local plants, like we have a refinery, which is mainly exporting products. So when you have tariff impacts, which could be detrimental for your local business, it's an export exporting activity. So for car manufacturers, it will be an issue. Uh, because they have uh, developed some plants in the UK for exporting. But for us, no, I don't see, I don't anticipate. We have the infrastructure, we, we have, there is no lack of infrastructure from an energy point of view. No Europe, and by the way, um, uh, Europe, when we speak about Europe, security of supply and, and all this debate about uh, Nord Stream 2 and all that, it's, it's strange to me because Europe is a continent where we have a domestic production which is declining. So we'll need to import natural gas. So what is the interest of Europe? It's to maximize the number of, infra of infrastructures which reach Europe. Either regas terminal, and today we have too many regas terminals, or regas terminals are <coughs> empty at, uh, are used only for 30%, empty 70%. So we have plenty of regas terminals in Europe. Or pipelines, but it's not because you have an infrastructure that it will be filled, you know. You have some, today we have infrastructure which are not used. So I think the interest of Europe is to maximize the number of infrastructure in order to be sure of the supply and then to organize the competition. What is good today for Europe is that the US LNG is putting in fact a cap on the natural gas in Europe. Because we know that we can import from Europe US LNG to this gas terminal. So this is a cap on the Russian gas price. That's all. But it's also obvious but the Russian gas is lower, is less expensive than the US LNG. And as a US LNG investor, I don't want to, say, to send my gas to Europe. I want to send my gas to China, which is paying more than Europe. 
And I was explaining that to an official of the US, US uh, this morning. By the way, there is a long de a geopolitical debate, but all the players in Europe and the US are private players. Who signs a contract for natural gas? Who is buying ga natural gas? Not the states. We are buying the gas. And at the end, we want it's a market. So the markets will arbitrate if we take gas from Russia, or we take gas from the US, or we take gas from Algeria, I don't know where. It's not governed by any geopolitics. That. So the debate for me is a little strange, and there is a, a geopolitical space, and there is, in fact, the real space, which is a market forces space, driven by market forces, where private players try to optimize for the interest of the consumers what is the best source of gas. So that's, that's clear. But, uh, so the rec or, but this competition is good for Europe because the gas price in Euro or Europe will remain low for long, thanks to the US and Russia competition. That's a conclusion for me. Uh, <laughs> and then I come to your very interesting question. Uh, first, you will be happy because I have signed, not because I was coming to meet you today, <laughs> but I have signed, and it's true, by the way, it was uh, Monday evening, a letter to the B team to adhere to the B team fiscal principles. You know, so total, I've, ri I've written a letter. It's part, of course, it's logic. We have been on, on, by the way, we have been very transparent, the first major company to publish the list of all our subsidiaries in the world, uh, wherever they are. We have a policy to get out of uh, some fiscal paradise. We still have, I think, 10, 10 subsidiaries, so it's limited, but there are historic positions difficult to get rid of. So we'll participate because I, I'm a strong uh, advocate for transparency. So society is expecting from corporations like Total, large corporations, transparency. And I have no problem to be transparent on many matters, you know, and to say what we do. Then the difficulty, for example, about when we, dis when we disclose all these figures, fiscal figures per country, per project, it's very difficult to read. Even myself, when I see the big tables, I have difficulty to understand what is in the table. And so it could lead some questions which are strange from stakeholders. But let's be, I have no problem with transparency. I think in the 21st century, with all these social networks, believing that companies like us can stay hidden is a big mistake. People are expecting so, be team. And transparency for contracts, you know our policy, we encourage the government. And in June, uh, there is a EITI, uh, I think, uh, meeting in Paris, by the way. And I'm planning to be there with the PNG Vice Prime Minister, and we should be able to announce that we will disclose all these PNG contracts that we sent for the gas agreement for PNG Papua New Guinea project. So we are moving. I hope that with what we do will be good examples for others. I encourage my peers. You know, you have different schools, but I cannot. Uh, I think you do your job. Everybody does its job. Uh, the governments, and um, but I think it's. Uh, I think in particular for the oil and gas industry, which is always accused because of, I think histories for 50 years ago, which are not at all the way we behave today. Our global interest is to be responsible and to answer to that and to, do, to, to say what we do. And honestly, once uh, so I know the objection is that it's competition, but you know, once you have the contract, nobody will take my contract. So even if it's transparent, that's good, you know. I, and all these contracts are signed in a perfectly transparent condition, so we can do it. So that's my policy. Uh, so thank you for your question. So and I will continue, even if I have some debates about with Oxfam. I disagree with the way they, you, you explained the added value is only for shareholders, you know, for dividends, which is not true at all. Uh, when you look to the way we allocate money, but it's good to continue to have the debate because it's good to, to convince the society that we are responsible player. Thank you. Th thank you for that question, and thank you for this whole session. Um, uh, as always, a conversation with you is a fascinating feast, and, and I think you can tell by the, how engaged the audience was and, and what great questions were asked, but also what incredible, transparent, and good answers you gave. Um, I would ask, before I ask the audience to join me in thanking you, I know that you have to get to another appointment, so if you could stay in your I have to listen, minute. Mr. Pompeo, for a dinner, so I will listen to him, you know, so okay. I need to understand the geopolitics driven by this administration. You know. yeah, if it's important to me. Yeah. Well, once you figure that out, come, come, come on back. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, but, uh, so please let uh, Patrick Pouinet uh, 
uh, get out without too much impediment. Uh, but join me in giving him a round of applause for a fascinating session. <laughs>